Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, this chance to talk about our research. Um, um, I'd like to talk about um, our research into vital parameter detection by radar technology. Um, we had the, the line permeating barriers because radar technology will permeate physical barriers like clothing, bedding, or wooden panels. But also it permeates a social barriers to technology because it's not so very obvious. It's not cables and electrodes. And there are many barriers still to look at and to, to tackle like um, integration, um, acceptance of new technology, a funding, a private or public. I think it's very interesting. We're talking about technology and its impact on, on social interaction. And we're having these uh, colorful uh, signal here going from green to amber to red, and Karen has the finger on the button. So um, this is a perfect example for how technology changes our interactions. Because I'm talking now in fear of um, getting the amber light. <laughs> I've looked, there's no trap door, so it's not getting worse than red flashing, but still, it changes the interaction. Um, where we are coming from, we are a consortium. Um, coming from the medical side, uh, the chair of palliative care, my head of department is Professor Oscar, who you see him at the um, upper left corner, actually at the lower left corner too. And we are, collaborating we are collaborating with many people, of course, in a diversified field, but primarily with the um, Technical Institute, uh, the Chair of Electronic Technology at the Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen. And um, the person holding this, this, this prize, this is Professor Weigel. You might not know Professor Weigel, but you might have been in contact with one of his, um, his innovations. Um, might use them regularly. It's the MP3 player um, that they invented and um, um, uh, developed together with the Fraunhofer Institute. And we are in kind of an intersection from the medical side and the technology side. And uh, there were so many challenges um, to uh, work together with, with very various partners to develop a, a common language. But we um, managed this over the course of um, several projects. And um, I do think this was a, a steep learning curve for us. What is our motivation for doing um, medical technology research? Uh, in palliative care, there are many everyday challenges, but, but some um, come up very, very often. It's predicting the clinical course. Patients next of kin will ask you, um, how long do you think I will have? It is also important for us, um, thinking about um, treatment, uh, which, which one is, is, is the right one, which is adequate, which is no longer adequate. So it's important to know the clinical course. Detecting crisis when we are not with a patient, monitoring of therapy, the effects and also the adverse effects of therapy. And um, another challenge is the lack of comprehensive longitudinal and objective data, especially in palliative care where we do not use technology so much. If we want to do technical innovations, we have to follow um, uh, several aspects which have to be in these innovations all the time. The personal encounter, the, the social participation, this is, this is our most important therapeutic tool in the last months and weeks of life. This must not be changed by technical innovation. Our, our, our care always has to be patient focused, never coming from the technology side, but we do have to have a clinical demand and this clinical demand has to be answered. But at the same time, we have to have reliable objective diagnostic features. We have to have comprehensive data and um, the safety of patients uh, in the interaction with the technology. And I was uh, stunned to hear that uh, your system gives out um, evidence-based automatic uh, advices. That's great. Um, but of course, that's um, very interesting to research how this changes uh, the interaction of patient, um, and physician, patient, nurses, and the safety aspects. Um, more to the point, we started one project which is called GUARDIAN, that stands for Guarded by Advanced Radar Diagnostics and Palliative Care Nursing. And if I tell you that one of our tech partners first came up with the idea to call it GUARDIAN, and then someone else had to come up with the idea, uh, what does GUARDIAN stand for? That was our first big challenge in the project. Um, it is all based on radar technology, as I told you, and um, just to break it down, um, we do have an antenna, and the antenna emits a signal which is reflected at the body's surface. It is a radar beam, so it permeates various kinds of barriers. It will be reflected at the first surface, which is as dense or denser than water. So it goes through clothing, bedding, it goes through wooden panels, 
um, is not hindered by it. So we are emitting a signal and it's being reflected. Our kind of technology is very bad in detecting absolute distances. We can only tell a half a feet, a feet, so we will never have a picture of what we see. But it's very precise in changes of distance. So if the surface of the body changes in relation to the, to the antenna, this we will detect. And we're so precise that we can see um, the hundreds of nanometers in um, about um, tens of uh, microseconds. With this um, precision, we try to see heart rate and breathing as vital parameters for comprehensive uh, monitoring. How do you see the heartbeat? I mean, people are turning. I'm standing here and I'm turning all the time. I'm talking, I'm breathing. And juxtaposed on all these movements, there's the heartbeat. And we, we cannot try to eliminate all this white noise and hope that the heartbeat will, will stay there when we subtracted everything else. We have to look at this pattern, specific pattern, juxtaposed on every other movement that the body makes, talking, turning, breathing. And it helps that the heartbeat is rather specific. This is the pulse wave. The pulse wave is, um, is generated first by the blood ejected from the, from, the, from the heart, which is the red curve. And then there's an echo coming back from the periphery, and that's the green curve. And together they make the actual pulse curve, which is depicted in black. And this will change, of course, at whatever point of the body that you're looking at with the radar. Um, and so we had to use an intelligent machine learning algorithm to, uh, to see what kind of um, uh, pattern it was. It had four um, standard pattern and a fifth pattern that was um, um, specialized or, or um, individualized uh, for the patient. Um, so this was a hidden semi-Markov model working in the back of the intelligent uh, machine learning algorithm, and these are the results. Uh, on the, on the um, x-axis you see the ECG, and on the y-axis you see the um, radar um, data, and what you see are the IBIs, the interbeat intervals. And you see at the correlation, it's a very close correlation, if we translate it to numbers, the F1 scores. So the um, radar actually detected the heartbeat. Within 20 milliseconds of the ECG, we had for a data set, so it's on the server and um, worked through retrospectively, about 98% um, accuracy, and for real-time monitoring, a monitor um, running in parallel to the actual um, detection, we had about 96% of um, accuracy. This was in, in 30 healthy participants. But we looked closer at the signal. This is the pulse curve, and the pulse curve is, is, is quite good for a heart rate, but we want to be, we want to be more accurate. And looking at um, the data more closely, and of course improving the robustness and the performance of the radar system all the time, we found these signals. They're, again, they're patterns, and as they're patterns, they're detectable over every white noise the body makes um, by any other movement. And if you look closely at the, at the lower graph, you might be remembered of something that you've seen in a textbook a while ago. Actually, we do see the heart sounds. So what the uh, physician listens to with a stethoscope, we do see the heart sounds by radar from a couple of feet away through bedding, through clothing. You don't have to believe this. Um, I'd like to show you a short video. I just hope it's running now. No? No, it's coming up on the wrong screen again. But I'm very fond of the video, so I still try to show it to you. Yeah. Now I'm asked to, to um, raise the app. So that's the video. You see Aaron, um, our youngest participant, um, all the cables that go to Aaron, they're the ECG, that's the validation, that's, gone, that's going on the, on the upper graph. Uh, the middle graph, these are the radar, this is the radar data, so the heart sounds. Um, the heart sounds are um, coming from, the heart sounds coming from the horn antenna that you see hovering above um, Aaron. And I do think Aaron is not disturbed, we couldn't ask him. Um, but I do think Aaron is not disturbed by the horn antenna, about a feet away from him. And most of all, looking at palliative care context, he can appreciate 
the closeness of the parents, the warm, snuggly feeling below the blanket, the warmth and the touch. And still we do have, um, we do have uh, data about him. That's the middle graph and the lower graph. The middle graph shows the um, radar uh, detection. The lower graph shows an intelligent algorithm which um, dissects the radar signal into four, um, four parts. So to um, get the heart rate from this. And this is the numbers that you see running through there on the, on the lowest graph. This is the ECG on the upper graph and the radar on the lower one. 102.6 beats per minute, 103.4 beats per minute. So it is fairly accurate. Being this accurate, we could start to look at other things. We started to look at um, implications um, that, we, that, that are derived from palliative care practice. Um, this is a setup um, we did with 40 patients. Our, um, pa not patients, sorry, participants. Our participants are lying uh, in the standardized setup. On the right side, you see um, a bowl with uh, ice water in it. This is a standardized um, pain test, the cold pressure test. The participant had to hold the hand into the, the water bucket for two minutes. This is, a, um, this is actually a feeling pain. You can try it at home if you like to. It's quite secure. And in the background you see a, a music therapist and we measured by radar the effect on the autonomous system by the um, pain um, uh, model and also how the pain or the, the answer of the autonomous nervous system to pain is modified by uh, music therapy. Because these are things that we do uh, in, in, in our daily practice in palliative care, music therapy, um, uh, animal therapy. And we are also, of course, we are asked, what are your outcome parameters? And we say the patients like it. But um, our cost barriers don't go with the patients like it. They want outcome parameters. So this is a way to talk um, about public funding too. I'm happy to announce that in, um, in the next week we're starting the rollout. I said we had 30 patients in a standardized setting, we had 40 patients in the, in the pain setting. But now we're starting on the ward with um, not participants but patients. Um, this is the setup that we're using now. These are four radars coming from below and uh, one radar coming from above. Um, patients who are willing to participate in the study, they can choose I only want uh, the smaller version. Um, then there would actually be no visible changes to the bed because the radar system that you see depicted on the um, lower uh, left corner um, is below the mattress. It's actually below the wooden panel of the bed and it's going through um, the wooden panel through the mattress um, up to the, the patient's um, uh, body surface. And patients who are willing to, to use the, the whole setup um, will also have another radar um, which is um, installed above. Then they would need this um, this installation on the bed that you see on the right side. And, um, well, we had uh, simulated situations. Our participants turned in the bed and talked. It went up and down. It was an electric bed, of course. And uh, with the four lower um, radar systems, we do have a continuous um, um, detection of heartbeat. So this is working. Um, why do we really want this, this uh, radar from above? This, this is an intelligent radar above. It's a MIMO radar. It looks at all the directions at once, and in a, in a second step, it can um, look at uh, different, different angles. And so it meanders over the bed. And of course, you can think if it meanders over the bed, it might also meander through a room. So we did some calculations looking at this room, at the number of participants here today. I would venture we needed about 16 radar systems above the um, ceiling, uh, it looks through the, through the uh, ceiling, um, to have all your heartbeats um, recorded continually. And this, of course, is a use case that goes beyond palliative care. This is a use case that goes into nursing homes, into hospital wards, anywhere. It's a use case also for uh, public installations, for um, prisons and the like, where there's a high suicide rate. So there are many applications, and that's um, why we're looking at um, different setups there. So we are ending the phase um, one, where we looked at participants in various simulated situations, and we're starting the phase two, where we're looking at patients. 
Um, unanswered questions is we only simulated clinical settings. We told the participants to talk to someone, to turn in the bed, to read a book, um, and to talk on the phone. It works, but we don't know whether it works with uh, real patients too. We simulated changes in cardiovascular and respiratory function. Um, you see um, a tilt table on the right side there. Uh, so um, by tilting the patient up quite uh, quickly, you could simulate a pre-shock condition. It's used to see whether um, someone loses consciousness because of um, um, cardio uh, dysregulation. So we try to simulate uh, changes in cardiovascular and, and respiratory function, but always with healthy participants. We don't know how it translates to, to patients. We do have um, very many um, questions in the LC um, area, ethical, legal, social implications, um, which are yet unanswered, and the interpretation of contextual data, of course. If you look at the autonomous system, of course, you know this from your, from your Apple, Apple Watch. Your Apple Watch tells you now you need to relax, you need to breathe, you know, now you need to take a stroll. I don't know. Um, it, it, tells you what to do based on, on heart rate detected by the Apple Watch and on heart rate variability. But you might have uh, seen it's, it's rather not, not too reliable. Um, um, this is of course a wearable and it's not uh, always providing skin contact so it can't be very reliable. But still, you can be, your sympathetic um, uh, um, nervous system can be activated because you're very happy because your, your uh, grandchild is visiting, but it can also be activated because you're in serious pain. So the contextual data is, is crucial for the interpretation in a clinical setting. Our innovations, to, to give you some context, um, are always coming from the clinical demand. We look in a technical background how to solve this. We're starting with proof of concept, going to healthy participants in controlled settings, simulated settings for further clinical applications. And then we go into the clinical trials, uh, into real life applications, um, and we do reach a technology readiness level of about seven. Um, but there's always uh, the need for a very good integrated research. So we need to look at social, ethical, legal implications, usability, acceptance factors, uh, of implementation, integrations in workflows. So we have a strong integrated research. And we've heard it over and over today. If we, if we look at patients next of kin, there are many interactions with, with the healthcare providers, but with society as a whole. Somebody has to accept this as a formative value to treat people in this stage of life such way or to spend funding for this. So, um, and if you go there and um, create a healthcare innovation, you are in need of a very um, robust uh, research into ethical, legal, social implications and to health tech assessment. We do have um, uh, a collaboration there uh, for legal implications, uh, for social sciences, socio-economic aspects, talking about public funding, private funding, technology assessment, ethical implications. So only with this, with this background, with this working group that we founded out of Guardian, with this working group looking at LC, um, we can actually try and do our medical innovations. It is in some kind of context that we do this. Um, the idea of, of twins, you might have heard of that. It's a concept coming from engineering. Um, one of the most famous examples was the Apollo 13 mission where they lost an aggregate um, to uh, purify the air and uh, they, built an uh, they, they built a model in Houston and by other things that they knew the astronauts had uh, in the shuttle and they actually made it work and they built it after the model they, they built in Houston. So this is, this, is, um, this is a famous example of a twin. And those identical artifacts, they are created, assessed and you can manipulate them and you can simulate effects which would, be, um, um, which would also happen in the original artifact given the same circumstances. Of course, you can do it much, much quicker with digital twins if you don't really have to build it. And there comes in an application in healthcare, of course. You can't build another person, but you can digitalize all the data you have from the person. So, for, coming from engineering, you have a digital artifact, and this is based on function and structure that you know. But not only this. You continually feed it by information from sensor data and Internet of Things information. So you have current information of the state of this singular object for the back before in front of the background or the backdrop 
of all the similar objects and the data that you have. So you can individually predict for this one object how it would behave in a simulated uh, environment. And this is, of course, um, a possible application in healthcare too, a digital health twin. So you have a patient coming in uh, a presentation. You have a lot of individual data of this patient, but you also have big health data from all the population with similar diseases and similar stages of diseases. And um, you have intelligent uh, data analytics, rule mining, machine learning, and based on these things together, in a fusion, you can do individual diagnosis, not as we do now. We do expect to see uh, this kind of life expectancy because we know this from statistics. We do expect this drug to work because we know it from statistics. We can actually, by digital health twin, tell you, now in your case, very much different from what we would expect in statistics, it will be so and so. And this is a rule changer in um, therapeutic uh, approach. We can choose therapy based on the individual properties of a person, therapy guidance, and we can do individual prognosis as to effects of therapy, as to health, um, as to survival prognosis. We do a project with um, DHIP, um, Digital Health Innovation Platform, and Siemens. Um, this is basically what we do. We, we, we use a symptom burden in palliative care as a model for digital health twins. We have a platform, and in the platform, a motor is something that works with the data given, or the information given. And we combine data-driven information coming from psychometric data, like the palliative outcome scale, health data, diagnosis, examinations, and biometric data, things that people have at home, uh, a blood pressure monitor, or blood sugar monitoring. This is the data-driven information. It is fused with expert-derived um, uh, information, and out of this um, should be generated a digital health twin for symptom burden in palliative care, where in a user interface you could um, have depicted the health status and the tra trajectory of the health status over time for the patient, because he or she is the first person who would want to know. And he or she will decide, who will I share this information with? With my physician, with my palliative care consultant. So it's, it's, the, it's the property, it's the data property um, uh, of the patient. And you can do predictive modeling and simulation. The patient can say, well, today I had a lot of dyspnea. And then in this system, he can choose to change the dosage of opioids virtually, digitally. And then the system will tell him with an 80% probability you will have less dyspnea tomorrow if you do this. With a 10% probability you will be more tired if you try this. So this is individualized um, predictive modeling and simulation for um, better therapy guidance, but also for, um, for better compliance. We need other, other sensor data. It's not only the data that we talked about um, looking at heart rate and heart rate variability. We need more data. Um, so we're using, um, in a DFG-funded DFG project, we are, we are looking at other um, sources of data, at optic data, infrared data, um, to have a more comprehensive picture. And we're looking at other patients, of course. Um, we're looking now in a project that will start on the, uh, I ho still hope October the 1st, but I do think it will be November 1st. Um, we're looking at, 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 at pediatric patients, um, early born, newly born, um, and we're looking at their heart rate variability, not to know whether they're very content or they're agitated, but the heart rate variability changes very significantly, three to 15 minutes before an epileptic seizure takes place. So this is a way to detect and to predict epileptic seizures in newborns, early borns, who will not tolerate an EEG, at least not for long. But a radar system from two feet afar um, that they will not see, as you've seen in Aaron, that they will not feel, they, they might tolerate this over a longer time. So I tried to be rather quick to give us some time for, uh, for your impressions, for your ideas, and for your questions. Thank you for your time. I have the mic if anybody wants to ask a question. 
Thank you, that's a really interesting presentation. I only have a very simple question. You know the um, image that you showed of somebody testing with the cold water yeah. and the music playing? Were there outcomes of that testing? Were there any results that you've done, or is that work your future planning? No, we did this. This was uh, those were 40 participants. This was the add-on study to the 30 participants in, in a simulated like bad situation. It was a simulated like pain situation. And um, this is what I meant with the contextual data. Um, we, um, we recorded the, the biometric data, and at the same time we had psychometric data. And looking only at the biometric data, you wouldn't understand what's happening. We had, in this setting, we had pain without music, of course. We had music without pain. We had pain with uh, just reading a text as a control. And if you just look at the music without any pain, you see sometimes the sympathetic system going down, and sometimes the um, sympathetic system going up. And just after looking at the, at the, um, at the psychometric data, when the, the participants told um, in, in a semi-structured interview about their likes and dislikes of music, um, of their past experience, we started to understand that for some this was very um, relaxing, the music, and the parasympathicus went up and the sympathicus went down, and for others this was exciting because they remembered something. And um, so their sympathetic uh, activation goes up. So we need um, always um, uh, the context to understand what our biometrics tell us. Thanks. Is there another question? Um, <clears throat> sorry, Michael Lucy from Limerick. Just wanted to ask you: Did you, or did you, ha did you have, or do you envisage any ethical approval difficulties when you actually try to apply this in the clinical setting um, for patients in a, let's say, in a, in a hospice unit or, or, or that type of thing? Well. There, there are two different aspects, because this is now in a study stage, so we um, asked for and got an approval from the Ethics Committee. Um, um, that was quite easy, because we could show that the, uh, uh, the power of the radar um, uh, system is about a twentieth of a commercial cell phone. So there is no technical danger, except for the radar falling on the, on the participant, of course. But, um, but from, from the radar system itself, there's no danger. A much bigger ethical question is the question of application in, in a real life setting. So not as part of a study, but as part of uh, the implementation and integration. And we do have partners in the consortium that are looking at ethical questions as um, a research topic within Guardian. And they are manifold. Uh, also, legal questions, they are manifold. Um, we are still researching there, that's what I said. We don't know what, what will come out of it. But of course, if we use in this very vulnerable situation a technology which is quite invasive, because um, which data is, is more sensitive and private than your heart rate? Um, we need to be very sure that um, autonomy and privacy of the patients is always respected and that they understand what consequences the use and also the decision not to use this technology will, will have for them in, in a way that they can understand, in the way that they can replicate before they make an informed decision. These are challenges that we are yet uh, researching. So you haven't actually got ethical approval for the next stage yet, have you? Oh yes, we do. This oh, is study. For, this, for the last stage and for the next stage, for the study stage, uh, we have ethical approvals, of course. Okay, we don't have any more questions yet. Thank, Thank you. you very much.